join with us in the call to worship.
Let's join together and proclaim our faith of the affirmation of faith. You, O oh God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches everything we do. You have always been with us. You are God. You, O oh God, are infinitely generous and good beyond all measure. You came to us before we came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You, O oh God, are Holy Spirit. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You reconcile and heal. You overcome death. You are our God. We worship you. The Old Testament reading comes from Psalms 107, verse 1 through 3, 17 through 22. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their inequities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He, seized, he sent out his world and, and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with song of joy. The New Testament reading comes from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desire of the flesh and senses, and we were, by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up, us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ, Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The children's scripture today is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Sing and make music in your heart, always giving thanks to God the Father. Our gospel message comes from John chapter 3. Beginning the 21st verse, hear the word of our Lord. Excuse me, I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> now hear the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus and his disciples went, John 3, 14 through 21, I'm sorry. Boy, I've really messed up, aren't I? Okay, John chapter 3, 14 through 21. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Whoever believes in the Son is not judged, but whoever does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Anyone who does evil things hates the light and will not come to the light because he does not want his evil deeds to be shown up. But whoever does what is true comes to the light in order that the light may show that what he did was in obedience to God. May God add, God add the blessing to this, the reading of our Savior's gospel. Amen. Hopefully you could tell from the call to worship that our story was Jesus' first miracle of turning the water into wine. Our units have been about love, Jesus' miracles, and uh, the widow's offering this time. So the nursery through kindergarten are going to sing for you and play for you a song entitled Celebrate the Miracles.
Our next song is a round, and um, we're going to sing it for you first, and then the kids are going to come out and help you sing with us um, for the round. It's called The Love Round, and I, of course, I forgot to have Carolyn print the words in the bulletin, but they're pretty simple. It goes, and many of you may have sang this when you were very young, it goes, love, 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 Christians, this is your call. Love your neighbor as yourself, for God loves us all. But they're going to sing it through three times. Nine times out of ten, we do it right. And hopefully this will be that uh, one of our nine times out of ten. You guys ready? Okay, who's group two? You guys All right, our nursery preschool kindergartners are helping the middle section right here. You're a little sparse, so you guys are gonna have to sing loud with them now, okay? So you start us off, coming in next, you all, and you all are group two, right? Okay, and coming in next is group three, yep. That would be this section, and you guys up there, and group four, you have your own little choir back there, okay? So um, please help us out with the love round. And the last song that will be performed by your first through seventh graders is a carryover from uh, the last time we were supposed to sing it called Lean On Me. And we've used this song. It's a very old song. Many of you might know it. Feel free to sing along. Um, but we've used this song as, in many different examples as though Jesus could be singing it to us or as though they could be singing it to you or as though you could be singing it to your neighbors. So... Please sit back and enjoy our version, I'm not ready, Andrew, of Lean On Me.
Patrick's Day. Well, after all that, I hope what I have to share with you will enliven your life and strengthen you and encourage you in your faith. You know, we live our lives dependent upon God's mercy. We don't think about that very much, but no matter what, no matter what we face in life, loss, illness, defeat, or even worse, by God's mercy and overwhelming love, we are able to rise above the strife and we are able to be saved. One writer commenting on the 107th Psalm stated this, however. He wrote, this message is diametrically opposed to what much of contemporary North American culture teaches people. In modern culture, maturity is often measured by how self-sufficient we are. We are taught that we earn what we have, that we are, we are taught that we must pull ourselves up by our bootstraps when we are down. We are taught that wisdom is getting ahead in whatever way we can whatever way we can manage without getting caught. We are taught that our security results from careful planning, investment, and management. In short, we are taught to be self-made persons. No need to cry to God for help, and consequently, no need to thank God for anything. Seldom, if ever, does it occur to us that human life depends on God. Well, that's a condemning thing for somebody to write. Think about it, though. For an example, it is God who engineered the process that creates the oxygen that you and I breathe, that we just breathe just now, and without which we would surely die. Our largest supply of oxygen in the world comes from the Amazon rainforest of South America. It is estimated that at the current rate that rainforest is going to be harvested, that by the year 2050, now I'll be, if I live, 100 years old, so it won't matter, I'll probably be dead by then. But I got grandchildren. By the year 2050, it will no longer exist. And it's our largest supplier of oxygen in the world from the trees. But that won't be a problem, you understand? That won't be a problem. I was discussing this with my grandson. My grandson, don't worry, don't worry, Grandpa. We'll all just have little oxygen tanks for everyone to wear. And that's just one thing. You see, we depend on God for our very existence, but we can mess that all up, and God is not going to stop us it's our problem if we mess it up we live by the choices that we make and some of you like me are old enough to know you've made some pretty bad choices along the way you made a lot of good ones but there's some you wish you hadn't made my life your life should have listened to mom and dad. Why should we recognize and why should we accept our dependence on God? Well, the first answer that the psalmist gives us to that question is because he is good. God is good. Jesus' half-brother James, the son of Mary and Joseph, wrote, every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. Hymnist Thomas Chisholm, in 1923, wrote the words to this great hymn that says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God our Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
God's faithful goodness to humanity, when it is put to the test, has never failed. Governments fail. People fail. Relationships fail. Friends fail. But God's love never fails. The psalmist even proclaimed in the 52nd Psalm and said in the 52nd Psalm that God's love, quote, is forever. God has been, is now, and forever will be good to us. Now, it may not be in the way you want it to be, you know, the greed side of you. What you think is good God's goodness, though, takes care of what we need. That's important to know. How we respond to such good is a decision that we must make either for God or against God, however. Another reason the psalmist gives us that we should depend on God is because God shares his goodness. In the ninth verse of the 107th Psalm, the writer says that God satisfies those who are thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. In the beginning, when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, it was God's intention that they live in true, a true paradise. There was nothing that they needed. God provided it all. It was all there. There was no death. There was no disease. There was no sin. The pair, however, made a misdirected choice. Evil tempted them and caused them to believe that they were capable of making their own decisions and caused them to believe that they could be gods themselves. Be like God. So they chose to go the way evil directed them to go and forgetting that it was God who made paradise for them in the first place, and forgetting that they truly were dependent upon God's good graces, and forgetting that they were the created, not the creator. That's what humanity does. We forget that we are the created, not the creator. So as a result of poor judgment, Humanity essentially turned our collective back on God's goodness and we lost it all and the paradise went away. And in the Bible it says, man will work by the sweat of his bow and he will, eyebrow, and he will work by the sweat of his brow and that woman will bear her children in pain as a result of their sin. Our Creator, however, thankfully does not give up on us, you see, the created. Therefore, God sent the best of God's goodness He had to offer. He sent His Son, Jesus, into the world. Jesus' explanation for why God, has, God sent Him into the world is quoted in John 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. That is his mission statement, that is his job description. His announcement is a crystal clear declaration of God's intention to share God's goodness with us all and fill our lives with spiritual, if not physical, abundance. How we respond to God's willingness to share it all, to share the best God has to offer, is again a decision that we must make. Ah, but the greatest point made by the psalmist for why we can depend on God is God loves us with a steadfast love. The disciple John was an old man when his words were written down in 1 John, you know, the three little books, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, back toward Revelation in the back of the New Testament. John was in his 80s at this point in time. So we're talking about somewhere around the year 70 A.D., 
60 A.D. And John said, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might ha live through him. In our gospel reading today, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. No, but that the world through him might be saved. God's love is forever. God's love is unconditional. God's love is meant for everyone. God's love is never failing. So, our existence depends on God's mercy. Our existence depends on God's love. We can deny it in our lives, but the truth will not go away. You know, that's a, that's a modern problem we have. We all like to live in denial. We all like to forget. Be yourself all you want to. It doesn't make your lie true. That's a fact. Ain't going to change it. But you can lie to yourself all you want to. And the truth is, our existence depends on God, God's mercy. The psalmist has in the 107th Psalm stated the case for why we should and can depend on God. You've heard what I said. God is good. God is willing to share his goodness. And finally, God loves us with a steadfast love. What more do you need? What is left to say is what our response to God should be for such great gifts as our Creator offers us. There are two clearly obvious ones to me. First, first, we should be grateful. We should be grateful to God Instead of believing the flawed logic that we mortals are self-sufficient, not needing God's help, why do I need to thank God for anything? I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and I am my own man, you will note. It gives me such pride. And look at my bank account. <laughs> Oh, I have stomped out so many people getting a bank account like that. I am so shrewd. Good businessman I am. Yeah. I knew how to crush those people when I had to crush them to get what I needed out of life. You know, I knew how to do that. Pretty good, eh? Of course, you all worship the kind of guy I am. You love it. You want it, too. You know, you, you do. You love it. You love it, don't you? You do. You really do. Well, here I am. I don't know God. Let's see. That's a common attitude. We should be grateful. Instead of believing the flawed logic that we mortals are self sufficient, not needing God's help. We should be grateful for God's mercies. We should be grateful for God's love toward us. We should be down on our knees saying, thank you, God, every single day of our lives. Because you didn't do it all by yourself. If you think you did, you're living in denial. You had lots of people along the way to help you. You had a mom, dad maybe, grandma, grandpa, aunt and uncle, brothers, sisters. You had people who stood behind you all the way and brought you to where you are. You had a God who gave you that love that you needed, which nobody else would give you. When you felt all alone, when you felt depressed, when you felt put down, when you felt like you weren't 
nothing but the scum of the earth. God was there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Every day. Not once in a while. Not just when you come to church. Not when you pray with Preacher Ed. Every day. The second response all of us should give up of the two that I said we do to respond to the, the three wonderful gifts from God is that we should have a steadfast love for God ourselves. The disciple John, after describing God's love, as I read to you earlier, went on to say, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. That, friend, is the basis for everything God has done with and for us. Love that deserves love in return. If you truly love, you give love back. Oh, I know it's nice to go through life having everybody love you, admiring you. It's great for the ego, makes you feel good. You know, I'm lovable and everybody loves me. But it isn't worth it if you don't give love back. You see, God loves us. We owe God love. God invented love. God is love. And if you have the ability to love, it's only because there is a God. And if you truly love, you'll return that love in kind. That's simple. That's simple. In theory, there should never be a war. In theory, there should never be poverty. There should not be anybody hungry, no one homeless. If we truly love, but, of course, being like Adam and Eve, all of us, you know, we have to believe that we can have it all on our own. God is love, and love deserves love in return. So, no matter what we face, no matter what, standing with us will always be the goodness and the steadfast love of God. For God is good, God is good indeed, and God loves us. Amen. Pray with me, would you? God, we are grateful for your love. We know sometimes it seems like we don't care. We get so wrapped up in ourselves and we go for our own self-importance and we look away at other things and don't look to you. Forgive us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for not seeing the truth in all of this that no matter what, you are with us. You are there. You've always been there. And your love prevails and can be a wonderful gift in our lives. Help each one in this room to see that and to live it, to allow it to occur in their lives, to feel your love, even in the worst of times. Bless each person in this room. Bless those who are not able to be with us today. Bless those who are watching us from their beds, sick, watching us on television. They'd like to be here. They'd love to trade places with anybody in this room just to be in this building, but they can't because they just, the body just won't move. But bless them, we pray. Let them know we care about them. Bless those whose names we've mentioned before the service of prayer. Watch over each one of them. Be near them. Be close to them. Help their families. We pray for them. Bless this community. Bless this nation. Be prominent in our thought. Help us to move beyond selfishness and greed and understand that we are called to be a sharing and caring people. Oh, Lord our God, we expect our children to play well when they share their toys. Why can't we as adults help us to see the truth in that and help us to be a blessing 
to this world in the way we live our lives, the way we share our faith, in the things that we do and that we say. And we ask God that you'd help us to know that we can make a difference. Thank you, God. Thank you for all you've done for us. We bless your holy name. We especially thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ in our lives. That you sent him into the world that we might have life and have it abundantly. And so, God, we lift this prayer before you in his name, knowing that Jesus taught his disciples that we may pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has blessed us in many ways. God shares with us much. As you share with God what you have to give, you'll be blessed the work of God. Give to you. Be grateful that you're able to.
fact that we are even able to give is such a blessing. That we're able to take part of what we've earned, part of what we've received in, from our earnings and, and give it away. And be able to go home and take care of our bills and our food and all the things that we have to take care of. It's a blessing to be able to do that. And so we give you gratitude and praise that you have given us so much and you've been giving us the ability to share that wealth with others and with the work of your church in the world. Bless the hands that brought these gifts to this place. Bless also the time and the talent that's invested along with them to serve you and the cause of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, for all that we have, for all that we are, for all the many blessings you bestow on us. And we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God is good, God shares his goodness, and God's love is steadfast. You can't have it better than that. So when you walk from this place, recognize that in your life. Live a life that blesses God for the love that God has given you. And go out caring about what happens to other people. You know, Kid Rock has a song out. He says, I can't shelter the homeless, I can't feed the poor, I can't take care of all the world's problems, but the least that I can do, the least that I can do, he says in his song, is care. We lack a whole lot of caring in the world. Be the people who care. Go forth from this place and bless others with your presence and your love. Go forth and be compassionate and faith-filled people, and God will be faithful to you. God's face will shine on you and God will grant you peace.